Hello and welcome to Hysteria. I'm Erin Ryan. And I'm Alyssa Mastromonaco. Alyssa, did you watch former President Trump's announcement speech on Tuesday? Who? Yeah, I didn't either. (laughs) What did you do instead? Definitely not. I had dinner with friends I had not seen since before COVID. Hmm. You, like Fox News, cut away from that speech. Cut away. Didn't even didn't even engage like most other news outlets, including the New York Post, by the way. <laughs> Amazing. Well, they're fully team DeSantis at this point. Now they are, but page 26, OMG. Oh, man. Alyssa, I am really excited to talk about the news this week. You are? Yeah. You know why? Why? Because I was fucking sick of midterm stories. So sick of midterms. Let's get back to some other good fucked up shit. I think, you know, I'm not totally sick of it because I do like, I never get, I'm never tired of of a like, oh, Katie Hobbs won Arizona. I'm I'm never tired of, of, of that kind of a headline. When I say I'm sick of the midterms, I was sick of the like, the dread associated Agreed. with an impending midterm election and a narrative surrounding it that Democrats were going to lose big and whatever, right. left me with a bad taste in my mouth. But Kinda. you know, Aaron, what have we always said? We've always said you can't listen to the polls. We've always said we don't listen to the pundits, and we don't. But even though you don't, you can't help but have it like infect your aura in a way. Oh, yeah. It's it's a bum out by osmosis. You just, yes. or, well, what what's the one that's not through water? You know what I mean. It's like when you're around it, osmosis it just kind of Osmosis is absorbed. fine. We get the, it's, it's you, you get You get the, rep, I, we just have really smart listeners and I know somebody is going to email and be like, actually, it's not. It's osmosis. Technically, if it's not through water. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing I remember from high school science class, mostly. That and a macrophages and chlorophyll. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, speaking of education, how do you like that side? That but um bum. University of California academic workers are striking by the tens of thousands. Alyssa, I was shocked when I learned how big this strike was. 48,000 University of California academic workers um, are now on the picket line. It's historically large. It is a huge amount of people. Um, And they are pushing for better compensation and protections. And they stopped working on Tuesday. And it is obviously causing disruptions to campus research, teaching, and grading because a lot of colleges and universities run on the work of criminally underpaid and I was, overworked people. My, my, I was – I was – I literally had to reread three times to make sure that I was understanding that the average pay for a graduate worker is $24,000 a year. Yes. In and California. In California. And they say that it's for a 20-hour work week, but every every grad student is like, that is – absolute bullshit. We do not work 20 hours a week. We work 40 or more hours a week. That is, that is such bullshit gaslighting by the by universities it. to say it's only 20 hours a week. It's like, you know that it's not 20 hours. Like, my first thought is like, have you ever talked to a grad student? And the answer is obviously they've talked to grad students. They, they run universities. They're college right. administrators. Um, but like, it is so patently obvious that despite the fact that it says 20 hours a week in a job description, the amount of work that they do is huge. And $24,000 a year is is criminal. I Absolutely just, criminal. That is, that is what I made in 1999 to be a uh, paralegal. Yeah. Uh, for postdoc employees, the union has called for a minimum salary of $70,000, which would be a $10,000 increase from the average postdoc salary at this point. So the proposed salary increases are they want a base salary for graduate student workers to be $54,000, which is still on the low side for a high cost of living state. And yet double, more than double what they're making now. Yeah. But what they're making now, to be fair, is is like horrifying. Yeah. Horrifying. It's mind bending. Um, and they also want uh, support for better child care and uh, health care, family leave options. Um, you know, academia is one of those worlds that it seems like there are so many barriers to entry if you don't have independent wealth. Um, it's almost impossible to survive uh, without making major sacrifices to your life. Like, you know, I think that there are people who are maybe 
in academia who chose academia and then when they were in it were like, look, in order for me to continue on this career path, I'm it, it's just not feasible for me to have a family. Right. And like these unfair circumstances contribute to like life trajectories of people. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's crazy. Um, so the strike has no end date. Yeah, I know. Saw that. Um, yeah. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. I, I truly hope that the academic employees of the University of California prevail here because um, it just – it's a it's a across-the-country problem. Totally. Exploitation of labor within academia. And if California is able to make it so that, that there's some – a little bit more dignity in – the compensation, um, then maybe other states will be forced to follow suit in order to be competitive to to get yes, students. As they should. Um, indeed. Uh, okay, Alyssa, what happened with Ticketmaster yesterday? Everyone I saw was talking about Ticketmaster. Well, Aaron, the Swifties, now they have many partners in their outrage, but the Swifties, uh, they got pissed yesterday because oh, no. uh, tickets to Taylor Swift's New Eras Tour, uh, Era Tour, Eras Tour, whatever. Eras, we we yeah. all know what I'm talking about. Yes. Um, well, the Ticketmaster website crashed, Aaron, and people were left waiting in the queue, you know, in the line for upwards of five hours for some people. Now, the reason that this is Well, I mean, one, it's absurd, but two, Ticketmaster many years ago, around 2010, Ticketmaster and Live Nation merged, which means that Ticketmaster and Live Nation represent, they they sell all the tickets and they also represent the venues and the artists, thereby making it a monopoly. Hmm. Um, Lots of people, everyone from AOC, the Congressman Bill Pascrell of New Jersey, have called for this to, this monopoly to be broken up. Um... Ticketmaster defends itself by saying, it's not that it's a monopoly, it's that it's dynamic pricing. So I Googled to make sure I knew what dynamic pricing was, and it's pricing based on demand, but when you control all the supply, of course there's going to be demand. This coming from a woman who got a B in economics. I'm just saying, Mm. that's why I always double check my math, because I'm never quite sure. But yeah, is it is it arbitrage or is it just fucking robbing exactly. people? Exactly. And so Ticketmaster, as we all know, charges all kinds of fees on any ticket purchase. Uh, they can charge, they have been known to charge up to 78% the cost of a ticket in fees. What? And in theory, these fees are what are known as convenience fees. Well, if you're waiting five hours for your fucking ticket online, how is anything convenient? So oh uh, it was it was high drama. And uh, as someone who has also been caught online trying to buy her ticket fees through Ticketmaster, only to be charged almost $120 of fee per ticket, um, I, uh, I was in solidarity with the Swifties yesterday. Okay, so you were charged an extra $100 in fees, which means you were buying pricey tickets to something. Let me guess what band it was for. Go Celine, ahead, Aaron. Stab Celine, in the dark. Celine Dion? So actually, her tickets were pretty expensive, too. That was the last <laughs> concert I saw before COVID. We no, I, like, I, know it's, I know it's the dead. I knew it was either Celine Dion or the, the dead, but I wanted to like roast you a little bit for your eclectic taste. I am, I am nothing if not eclectic in my music. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if Celine Dion covered a bunch of dead songs. I mean, sh- she can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, hopefully this will lead to I mean, look, I, there are there are a few fandoms that I would not mess around with in any way, shape or form. It's the Swifties and the Beehive. <laughs> the Swifties and the Beehive and like the K-pop stands. Oh, K-pop correct. stands are are do not mess with. That's in the do not mess with category. Um, I think that if anybody can get this done, it would be either Swift. Is, has Beyonce announced a tour to support her? Late, no, but her? she did just get nominated uh, for Grammys. And she and Jay-Z are now tied for most Grammy nominations, beating out Quincy Jones, Kanye, and Paul McCartney. Oh, I'm good. full well, of music get, facts today. Let's push Kanye off that list. I know, because- I know, I know. <laughs> Woof. Um, the soundtrack to so many of my parties and runs from the years 20- 2004 to 
2016. Uh, tainted. <laughs> tainted. Uh, but yeah, I think if anybody can can change the world when it comes to Ticketmaster, it would be the the scary the scary trifecta of fandom: Swifties, the Beehive, and K-pop stands. So. I'm 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 rooting for you guys. <laughs> Please unfuck Ticketmaster. That would be amazing. Anything else? Uh, toast roast. I got a quick toast. Okay, Aaron. I want to toast Christina Applegate. She received her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame earlier this week, and it's her first public appearance since being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And the reason that I think one, I think she's awesome. I love Dead to Me. I think that she is terrific. But also. I'm so glad that she's being public about her MS diagnosis like Selma Blair was years ago because it's this affects so many women. And also, both she and Selma Blair have said that if they had – if anyone had taken their symptoms seriously early, their prognosis might have been slightly better. And so anyway, I just – good for her and proud of her and all of her support. Linda Cardellini and, and all of the gang was out supporting her and I just thought it was wonderful. Ugh, this is going to sound corny, but I love it when they're friends in real life. I or, know. Or like good at at least pretending to be friends in real life. And wait, like, who was her mother on, um, who was her mother on Married with Children? I would not Katie. know the answer to that question. Yeah, I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Anyway, but. she was there too and she was supporting her and said she still feels like her mom in real life. You know what? I have read that, this is a side note, but I've read that the set of Married with Children was actually like a very wholesome and supportive place. Really? I was not allowed to watch that show growing I up. I wasn't either. I wasn't either, but it's really funny to think about like iconic multicam sitcoms of that era and you have like on one hand the Cosby show and then on the other hand you have like, you know, the Cosby show family, whatever, uh, Elf. And then you have like Married with Children, which is like the raunchy, rude show. Yes. And then it then actually years later, it comes out that that was the show where people were treated really well and it was totally. a very healthy set. And then the shows that projected health and morality were actually not the healthiest and more, most moral of places, but whatever. And also it was Katie Seagal who played, who played Peggy Bundy. I can't believe I oh. forgot that, but Katie Seagal. I'm glad they're still friends. That's mm-hmm. great. Well, let's take a quick break. Um, when we come back... We have an interview with one of our faves. Fave. One of our faves. And it's a happy interview. So stick around. And welcome back, Alyssa. I love victory laps. I love taking a victory lap. I think we've earned one. I think we, we don't want to rest on our laurels. Ever. But Never. a victory lap is like warranted mm-hmm. after certain performances, especially in our guest's state. Today's guest is a state senator representing District 13 in Michigan. If you're outside of Michigan, you might have gotten to know her when a floor speech of hers went viral earlier this year, back in April, which actually seems like it was 10,000 years ago. A lifetime. Like, I feel... 87 years ago. So long ago. (laughs) Um, During that speech, she called for an end to fringe political lunacy. Hmm, interesting. Senator Mallory McMurrow, welcome back to Hysteria. Thrilled to be back. Thanks for having me. Um, Well, we're delighted to take this victory lap with you. Democrats across the country feeling good about last week's election in most states, not not Alyssa's state of New York, but in most states feeling pretty good. It's a Um, sad trombone here in New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Can you, Mallory, tell our listeners what happened in Michigan and why it's such a BFD? What happened in Michigan? Okay, so for context, I serve in the state Senate, and the last time that Democrats controlled the state Senate in Michigan was 1984, Whoa. which is before I was born. So <laughs> in Michigan, uh, on election night, we reelected Governor Gretchen Whitmer, reelected Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, reelected Attorney General Dana Nessel, and flipped the state Senate and the state House. So we have a Democratic trifecta in the Mitten State. It is a BFD. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, can we call it Big Gretch Energy? Is that yes. fair? Oh, yeah. Big Gretch Energy. Leather jackets everywhere. <laughs> Oh, my God. Okay, so, Senator, when we had you here on Hysteria last, it was after a speech of yours went viral earlier in the year, when you called out a Republican colleague for being hateful, prompting thousands of people nationwide to donate to your campaign. Part of the money went towards making the Michigan Senate turn blue, which you did, as we just talked about. What does this chain of events say about what Americans wanted out of the midterms? And do you think if folks had paid attention to why... Uh, you went viral earlier in the year that the outcome of the midterms wouldn't have been so shocking? 
Yeah. So how to break it down. So uh, the speech that I gave back in April, really the, the thesis of the message was hate won't win. And you can't build a campaign entirely on attacking two trans kids who want to play soccer and expect that you're going to be successful. Uh, and the Republican Party, you can't say I didn't try to tell them, but they did not listen to that message. So in the wake of that speech, uh, I found out that the email that my colleague sent out fundraising to attack me, she raised $235. Apparently, that's what it's worth these days to call your colleague a child molester. Uh, I launched a PAC, and I have been working my tail off since April to help all of my state Senate colleagues. And I raised $2.35 million oh! to help <laughs> flip the Senate blue. And it went directly to our candidates all over the state. Uh, and I think not only in Michigan, but if you look at the races where where Democrats did well all around the country, it just felt like a slap in the face rejection of this politics based on lying. Every major election denier lost. Uh, and in Michigan, you know, the Republican Party really doubled down from the governor nominee on down on culture war attacks. And they failed and failed miserably. Mm hmm. So another massive win for Michigan was enshrining abortion rights into, into its constitution. What can activists in other states learn from this successful campaign? And after achieving this, what will your advocacy for reproductive rights look like moving forward? So this was huge. So for anybody outside of Michigan, Prop 3 uh, amended our state constitution to enshrine abortion access and reproductive rights. So maternal health care, uh, sterilization, if that is something that uh, a woman and her family so choose later on and a lot of other things. And something that I think we learned in Michigan and that a lot of other folks can learn from is we leaned into this issue early and head on well before the Dobbs decision. Uh, Governor Whitmer filed a lawsuit against the state that actually led to a judge barring our 1931 abortion ban from going into effect. So abortion remained legal in Michigan even after the Dobbs decision. And she really made it a hallmark of her campaign early that she was fighting for abortion rights, even when pundits around the country said, you know, Democrats are talking too much about abortion rights. Gretchen Whitmer did not. In the legislature, my colleagues and I have introduced legislation since 2019 to repeal our abortion ban and effectively codify Roe into law well before we lost Roe. And then Prop 3 uh, started circulating, collecting signature petitions, again, well before Dobbs. So I went to a rally uh, in Detroit on the day that Dobbs fell. And I was able to tell people there who were angry and frustrated, like we all were, that this is a state where you can actually do something about it, that we've got a governor who's fighting for you. We've got legislators who are on the ballot and we've got this uh, petition drive that you can collect signatures for. And it was such a hopeful message and strategy versus people around the country who were pissed off that suddenly we lost Roe and national Democrats were texting you asking for five bucks. So this was a very tangible, like we've been fighting for you. We've been fighting for you since day one. We're not waiting for something terrible to happen. Here's what's standing in the way. And here's why we need your help and what you can do. And it rallied so many people behind not only the effort to get the initiative on the ballot, but also for all of our candidates who are really aligned on this message. So it sounds shocking, but treat voters with a level of respect and <laughs> actually show we're fighting for you. We're not just waiting for polling data, um, but here are the hurdles and here's what you can do about it. And if you do that, we are going to fight back for you. So what it changes for us now is, you know, abortion is enshrined in our state constitution, but we still have this 1931 abortion ban on our books. So for those of us who are in the Democratic majority now, uh, I know that it's going to be a, pr a priority for us to repeal that law, get it off the books once and for all so it is not haunting us from the past. In addition to that, what do you want to do in Michigan with the Democratic majority that you now have? This is an agenda 40 years in the making. So I think the short <laughs> answer is everything. But we have to be really strategic about it. Uh, when we met with the governor, a Democratic trifecta has only happened in Michigan four times in the past hundred years. Mm. 
So we are getting together now. Uh, we elected Joe Tate, the first black speaker of the House in state history. Uh, Senator Winnie Brinks, the first Senate majority leader who's a woman in state history. Very exciting. So over the coming weeks, we're putting together an agenda that repeals the abortion ban, uh, amends our Civil Rights Act to protect the LGBTQ community, invest more in education, you know, basically kicking the voucher scheme from Betsy DeVos out for good <laughs> in a state like Michigan. Uh, and then it's about environmental protections, water protections, uh, gun violence prevention and sensible gun reform, uh, increasing union participation and protecting worker rights. I mean, there are so many things we're going to be able to do all of them, but we have to be strategic about it and make sure we're also putting Republicans in a position to have to take bad votes on things that are really popular because we do have majorities in both chambers, but they are slim majorities. And if we learned anything from history, you know, Michigan is a swing state and we've got to make sure that this is the last time Republicans are going to see leadership for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's crazy that Michigan went from a Trump pro Trump spoiler in 2016 to what we're talking about today. Like it is and and I think looking at Michigan, I think other states can maybe be a little less discouraged. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that there are other places in the country that that are probably dealing with a kind of post-election day 2016 Michigan vibes right now where they are. And, and like the work that you guys have done, that you all have done in Michigan is is such a testament to how much things can turn around. So, so exciting. Um, I've been saying Michigan is great. I have. But it, is uh, time. <laughs> it is. It is great. I think Michigan's the future, to be to be frank. Um, so, Mallory, we like to close on a, a lighter note. You are a Notre Dame alum. What are your good luck charms in your political life? My good luck charms in my political life. Uh, my husband, number one, shout out to political spouses, because this is a wild uh, career choice that I've made, especially this year in the wake of trying to turn weird notoriety of being called a groomer into something really impactful. <laughs> um, so that's a good luck charm. Uh, and I think my weird neurotic dog, if that's a good luck charm, she's just <laughs> such a freaking goofball, but I put her on like campaign materials and the number of people who ask me in public, like, how's your dog doing? Is she like, should people follow on Instagram and they're like, is her ACL okay? How's she doing from surgery? So, <laughs> never underestimate I'll the power of dog content. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's so funny. How long have you had your dog? She is, she'll be 11 this year. So we got oh her when she was God. two. Oh my gosh. She's, she's a ride or die kind of a dog. She yeah. is. She getting, she's getting real gray from when, you know, the, <laughs> the photos resurfaced when she was a spring chicken. She's not anymore. She's slowed down. We're all oh. getting gray. <laughs> <laughs> I Me mean, too. I'm like growing a veil of gray hair. So your dog's in good company. Uh, Mallory McMorrow, thank you so much for stopping by. And we would love to have you back again sometime the next time Michigan does something amazing that we're all jealous of in the rest of the country. <laughs> it's going to happen a lot more often. Get ready for it. We're in charge now. We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> 